So I'm married to this guy named Rick, tall, dark, handsome, love him with all my heart. I may mention him here and there, so I just thought you should know who Rick is. Like, who's she talking about? Um, so, oh, here's a picture. Okay. Um, <laughs> You know what Rick told me? Rick told me, he's like, honey, in the mind of God, the day already happened and you had a great time with all those ladies, so just enjoy yourself because that's what's going to happen. I'm like, what a great perspective that is. That is really neat. Now, here's another thing, sweet ladies, that I'm going to tell you. Okay, just need you to notice the red jacket matches the red sandals, and I'm taking it off because it's hot. Okay, so um, just doing that. Cute outfit, thanks so much. I thought it was gonna work, but not so, all right? I don't know if it was cute or not, I'm 60. Like, I try to work on cute, but like, it's not a big deal to me. 60, I love being 60. Okay, yeah. You know why? Because um, at 60, you still have a little zeal left, but you don't really care what anybody thinks any longer. So it's just like perfect. So, you know, lean into those things, okay? When you're, don't worry about being 60. Be like, happy day. I'm going to be 60, okay? That is not at all what we're talking about. <laughs> but, um, so there are some things, th there are some things we should talk about today. I am so um, thrilled to be here. I do realize why I was giving my introduction, I overused the word excited, but I just am. So um, just bear with me on that, okay? Now, um, we're going to talk this morning. Um, and first of all, Nicole, where did you go? There you are. Thanks for your worship. I love it. I love that we sang, and they'll know we are Christians by our love. That was fantastic. I haven't sang that in for a bit. So I love that. That was really, really neat. And I'm thankful for Don reading the scriptures to us. So uh, today we're going to talk about some God nuggets from the scripture. So I thought, and Don's going to help me there. We're going to start it here. So because we're going to talk about God's nuggets, I brought you chocolate nuggets. Okay, it's never too early for chocolate girls. All right, so she's going to start a basket there and send it back and a basket there and send it back to you because we're going to have all kinds of nuggets. Um, and in your folder, I think you have student notes, okay, notes that you can fill in. So just go ahead and grab those um, if you're uh, that kind of a person who is a note taker. All right, as we study... Um, and fill up today, we're going to throw ourselves into the midst of pairs, pairs in scripture, where one person had the opportunity to invite another into their life to have a plus one relationship so that that person had somebody to journey with. That's what we're going to speak about this morning and throughout our day. We're going to see whether or not that makes a difference. If we add a plus one to our lives, would that enable us to open our eyes to new possibilities in leadership, to reach new goals in leadership, and even if you have somebody next to you battle anxieties that we sometimes feel in leadership. Now, truth is, leadership is this beautiful gift from God, and it really comes wrapped in, what the heck am I doing? <laughs> like, do you feel that way sometimes? Like, okay, I'm in this role, and now I'm not sure what, what I'm doing here. But this spot, this spot that God has placed each of you in, this spot is opportunity. All right? Can you say that word with me? Opportunity. That's the spot we're in. So we're going to talk about that because our opportunities have all come through the providential hand of God. Can I hear an amen on that? Like that is what our God does. Now, you know, at my age, um, I have learned massive amounts of information that I can't remember at all, <laughs> okay? Yet, um, if you're like me, <sighs> please tell me you're like me. You, you think you do know something about everything, right? 
Like, isn't that, as women, how we sometimes feel? Like, okay, I think I know about that. So my husband teases me a lot about this because he's like, honey, you are so sweet, but you're so dogmatic about things you don't have a clue about. And I'm like, he's so right, okay? Like, sometimes we'll be driving in the car, and we'll come to an intersection, and he's like, which way do you think it is, left or right? And I'm like, babe, it is right. Guess which way he goes? He goes left, because I'm lost in a paper bag. Like, so it is just so interesting, but I have to remind myself, I don't know what I think I do, right? One thing I do know, this one thing I do know, I know that I want to grow old graciously. I don't want to be grouchy when I get old. How about you? I also know this, I want to be a lifelong learner. So let's define that. What's a lifelong learner? A lifelong learner is being a receiver and not a resistor to someone speaking into me from now until eternity. Now, why is that important? It's important because it's one thing to think you know, it's another thing to know someone else knows. Let me start with this truth nugget for you. Knowledge can't be created in an environment where everything is already known. You can't learn something when you know it all, right? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands or anything, but how many of you know that person who is a know-it-all? Now, how many of you enjoy being around that type of person, <laughs> right? So, like, ah. Okay, if we were truly honest, don't raise your hands. <laughs> How many of you are in your church lobby and you're walking through and you see that person and you're like, oh, I got to go check the kids' zone? <laughs> Tell me you've been there, right? So that sometimes happens. But that person, that person can live inside of us. We can be that person. I think the older we get, the more we've got to guard against that know-it-all spirit that we can give off. You, uh, you don't know, maybe, if you're giving it off. Um, here's an easy test. When, when someone's talking to you, are the two words that you always say back to them, I know. I know. How many times have you asked somebody for help in a situation, they tell you and you go, oh, I know. I, sometimes when that happens, I'm like, let's see now, why did you ask me? Because I'm, I'm not following this real clearly. But we can give off that kind of a spirit. And when those are the two words that we often repeat to somebody, that right there shows us, oh, I'm not really leaning into being a lifelong learner because I think I know it all, all right? So um, it's okay. It's okay not to know it all. It's okay, and it's actually kind of exciting not to know it all because then we're just really, really growing. We could live our lives acting like we have never had the need to learn anything. Ooh, that's kind of scary. You know, they say that every time you learn something, you get a new wrinkle in your brain. Have you, you know, you know the picture of your brain with all the wrinkles? They say when you learn something, you get a new one of those. Bring on the wrinkles, girls. Bring on the wrinkles. Okay, like it's so important for us. So I think there's also a God nugget that's addressed in the scripture that we read today from, from the Gospel of Luke. Now, you've already turned that turn there. And so as we approach this por sort of portion, I'm guessing you're going to think that I am actually going to identify with the older woman here, with Elizabeth, okay? But actually, we're going to learn some neat lessons from Mary that I think largely attributed to her godliness, and I think it can largely attribute to ours. So as I was studying it, I was like, oh, these are lessons I need to learn. And I'm hoping they might be lessons that encourage your heart 
also. Now, as we're introducing our topic this morning, we're actually reviewing a story from the Bible that you're quite familiar with. Um, you know the beautiful details of this story. There's this young woman who's a virgin. She shall have the honor of being the mother of Jesus. Um, it's kind of powerful in KJV. We don't always read KJV a lot, but KJV, it says, Thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt have the naming of him. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. So this, though this young woman lives in poverty and obscurity, yet she'll have the honor of being the mother of the Messiah. Such, as, such a one as the world needs rather than such a one that the Jewish people of that time expected. But this is what we're going to learn from Mary, okay? Mary needed to receive, that's a very important word, from someone. That's a vital word, period. We could almost close in prayer and, and go get a donut, but we'll keep going for a few minutes. What did she need to receive? It was an incredible, heavy moment in her life. Some of you may be having these heavy moments in your life, in your ministry. She needed relentless acceptance and appreciation of God's will for her life. And in order to receive it, she had to have a heart of reception. It had to be her posture. And it is honestly our hope. So the definition of reception is the action or process of, re of receiving something sent, given, or inflicted. It is a function, you can circle that on your notes, within your mind to welcome another's input. Does that characterize your heart and mine? So this is gonna be our outline today. Be quick to be receptive, allow the spirit to work as you're receptive, and greater belief comes with reception. I'm gonna stop one more time and we're gonna to pray together, okay? Father, we look for you to open our hearts to your truth, your word, and the power that it can have on our lives. May we be receivers as you speak to us this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. So Mary has just learned that she's pregnant with God's son. After showing, showing teenage hospitality to an angelic company, um, she has only one thing on her mind after Gabriel leaves. She has got to speak to Elizabeth. Now, you know the story, but I love how the CSB recounts it. It said this, in those days, Mary set out and hurried. We can all relate to that word. She hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah. Now, I want you just for a second to place yourself in this story, right? Mary knew few, if anybody, was going to believe her story. Correctly, she understood, I'm going to need the grace of God to get through this. Her faith needed to be encouraged and her peace protected. She needed a safe place and that safe place was named Elizabeth. Mary needed somebody in the moment in it with her. Now, um, you know, it's not a given that Mary responded the way she did. Think about it, um, all human aspects of the factual account, if we don't really put ourselves in there, we're going to kind of miss it. But Mary was in a vulnerable situation. You know, we read, Yahoo, she's pregnant with the Messiah. And she's like, hey, y'all know I'm like 12 to 13. <laughs> y'all know that. Um, she's not married. See, this was an infliction of sorts placed on her. So what could have been her response? I like to call it twisted arrogance because she could have been like, you know what? No one understands me. I'm completely alone. I must bear it all myself. We get it because we're in certain situations that cause us to, I think, almost have paralyzing fear wrapped around us. It's human 
for us as ladies to make excuses and isolate. Traveling with us are these internal reasons why we can't really trust other people because we are the doers, we're the fixers, we're the givers, not often the receivers. So we gotta hit pause just for a minute on this because right at that spot where we're thinking, no, I'm the doer, I'm, I'm fixing everyone. <laughs> Often God says, hey, let me bring somebody in alongside of you to encourage you. Let me bring a plus one into your life. The question is, are we willing for that plus one to join us? So let's look at our journey. Point number one, be quick to be receptive. I want to read to you, if I can, verse 39. Verse 39, see my stool? So nice. In those days, Mary set out and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah. Okay, so she's on her way. Mary longed to talk over a, a, a few things that she had had a thousand things going on in her mind, and she thought, I can really freely converse with my cousin Elizabeth. And so, you know, like, okay, you just gotta appreciate KJV, because KJV said she hastened that's a great word. She hastened to Elizabeth. It was her point of decision. I must quickly get to a place where truth is spoken over me. Now, according to psychiatrists, letting someone speak into you really isn't what we want to do. You and I know this. We resist things sometimes when we don't even know we're resisting. Isn't that right? So let's check it out. Do you resist being receptive or are you what I'd like to call an active receiver? So on your notes, there's a little examination for you to take just for a second here. All right, now just go, go with your first thought. You don't, don't overthink this sweet one, ones, okay? We all have the tendency to overthink them. But go ahead and uh, assess that right there on your notes. On Sunday mornings, I have a spirit of reception to learn and then I purposely apply it on Monday. Go ahead. You, you know, I, I hate it when people read the notes that are there as though you can't read. So y'all go read through it, and then we'll keep going. After you've gotten through those, just look at up at me so I know the majority of us have. So the Holy Spirit made sure the story of Mary and Elizabeth made the final edits into the Gospel of Luke. I think so we could have a tiny spotlight into life and the need to receive from others. Because should we lose that, we would be losing something huge from this story. I need to receive. I need to be a receiver. As you look at your notes, um, the phrase, so she went, or she hastened, you see the Greek word there. It means she went with care, diligence, and expedition. She was very focused. She went not to divert herself, but to inform herself. Can you imagine how she might have wanted to be distracted through this whole little thing, like, oh, but she didn't. She just wanted to be informed about how to walk through it. What's beautiful about Mary's heart of reception, it demonstrates a heart of willingness to experience life under the care, concern, and wisdom of another. And it prompts us to say, do I demonstrate el that? What else do we see demonstrated by this sweet woman named Mary? The mother of Jesus, she resisted isolation. This was, of course, unfamiliar ground she was walking. She first had to ponder, and then she had to run to somebody she could ponder with, right? It was a moment to receive from another protection around the judgment that would come. The mother of Jesus also chose humility. Now, she's carrying the Messiah, handpicked by God himself to be the mom of Yahweh, yet she is not too proud to say, 
pour on me, please. Help me, please. Encourage me, please. I need your wisdom, please. I need your accountability, please. I need your prayers, please. She positioned herself to receive. The mother of Jesus also was learned. Luke 156 says, and Mary stayed with her about three months. Then she returned to her home. You know what was happening in those four walls? They shared their hearts, their fears, their joys, their faith. They laughed together. But Mary was receiving instruction, and her receptivity opened her up to possibilities yet not experienced in different ways of, I think this is so important, perceiving her experience because she responded to another godly woman. The mother of Jesus also trusted to receive, Mary had to reach beyond the intensity of her situation, and she had to begin to replace and reframe her thoughts all around this. See, truth and receptivity come to the mind that is ready for them. So without receptivity, in moments that you and I are leaders, we could spiral within what we already know. We could be locked in our minds cycling just old stories, old ways to do it, old narratives. We could just keep repeating our own beliefs endlessly in our own private conversations in our minds. We've, we're all hardwired to think, no, I'm right on this. And when we think that, we can easily get stuck. We can easily spin, we can easily loop. So it goes much deeper. Because, see, if we refuse to believe what does not correspond with our own ideas, when something different comes into our thoughts and, and challenges us, if we don't receive it, our perception within our leadership is going to remain stagnant, static, and rigid, and nothing is going to move. So the lack of receptivity can create a barrier, a kind of wall around us, and all of this was exactly the opposite of what Mary was demonstrating. So I want to back up in the story just a minute because I want to read to you verses 34 and through 38. It says this, and you can look in your scriptures. Mary asked the angel, how can this be since I have not had sexual relations with a man? The angel replied to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her, who was called childless. For, okay, you're, you're going to give me a big amen right here. For nothing will be impossible with God. Amen. That's right. Nothing will be impossible with God. And then Mary said, I'm the Lord's servant. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel left her. Just think about this for a second. See, here's another nugget. Before God brings us to heaven, he brings something of heaven to us, and it's called the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. People say to me often, um, don't you wish, especially when the chosen came out, you know, don't you wish you walked when Jesus walked? I'm like, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. And they're like, you don't? And I'm like, no, because like I need the Holy Spirit. Like I'm so thankful I got the Holy Spirit going. So I'd rather live right now. When, the, when we have this availability of the Holy Spirit filling us, I, I'm because I would have been Peter, or any of them, or all of them. I think I would have been all of them. So I'm so thankful. You know, you and I hear about it every December. The birth of Jesus here on earth had much to do with the Holy Spirit. Um, it's kind of spectacular for this story, right? Um, I don't want it to be speculative and abstract for your story. So as we keep reading, it says this. In verse 39, in those days, Mary set out and hurried to the town. We see that. Then starting up in verse 39, it says, uh, in 40, where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped inside her, 
and Elizabeth was filled with the Spirit. Now, I don't want you to miss that, okay? Because this is the first mention in Scripture about being filled with the Holy Spirit. And we got to hit pause because I got to say, we got to examine our hearts. Not like just in the morning, but like all through the day. Am I being, am I a woman filled with the Spirit? See, are there days that you're so busy you're okay not to wonder about that? Like, we, we can't be that busy, okay? Imagine not being filled with the Spirit when you are serving in leadership. Now, John Piper gives a great, tremendous, workable definition. In fact, I found this definition, like, life-changing, as though the curtains were pulled back on the concept. What does it mean being filled with the Spirit? And he says, okay, this just blew me away. Having great joy in God. Wow. Like, you should get a tattoo of that. Okay, that's so good. That's worth you being here right now. How did he come to that? I want you to turn over in your Bibles, if you would, to Psalm 34. Psalm 34. Um, see, joy, this whole idea about joy, right? Joy can be caught in your head, but sweet ladies, we got to feel it in our gut. Okay, it's so important. The Bible requires of me things that I cannot immediately produce on my own, and joy is one of those. But do you want to be a strong, influencing leader? It's not checking off events or studies. It's not coordinating your kids' own ministry or leading your worship team. What makes you strong and inspiring is what Nehemiah 8.10 says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. It's produced by the Spirit, and it's demonstrated by being a woman that's filled with the Spirit. You know, uh, I want to ask you, in your leadership, are you joyful? How about the atmosphere within your church? Is it, is it joyful? Uh, I think for many churches, if the Holy Spirit removed himself, we would keep on functioning as though nobody missed a beat. That's really scary. See, the number one thing this world needs is you and I being Holy Spirit-filled, joyful women. It is our strength. Your church needs you to be joyfully Spirit-filled. Your family needs you to be joyfully Spirit-filled. The fight and the energy needs to go to that, and the result of this is really magnificent. Can I read to you Psalm 34, verses 4 and 5? They're some of my favorite. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and rescued me from all my fears. Those who looked to him were radiant with joy. Their faces will never be ashamed. Do you see the power of joy there? It's a power of overcoming our fears, our doubts, our tensions. There will be an energized vibe coming from you if you will practice radiant joy. Now, the definition of radiant, sending out light, shining or glowing brightly. So let's go back just for a second to Luke 1 to our pair here, because there's a couple things we just want to see. See, they were caught in this moment together where joy flowed, okay? It says there in verse 42, Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed. She was like full of joy, okay? She squealed. How fun is that? It was a bright moment for her. Why? Because they were caught in the supernatural moment, all wrapped in the love of the Father, all about the love of the Son, and all empowered by the love of the Holy Spirit, right there at that moment. So do you wonder if being filled with the Spirit is that important? I want to read you what Matthew Henry says about this portion that we're reading right here. At their first coming together, for the confirmation of the faith of both of them, there was something very extraordinary. Mary knew that Elizabeth was with child, but it does not appear that Elizabeth had been told anything of her cousin Mary's being designed for the mother of the Messiah. And therefore, what knowledge she appears to have had at that moment must have come that day 
by a revelation from the Spirit, which would be a great encouragement to Mary. That is how important being filled with the Spirit is. Now, Mary could have disregarded the angel's comments. She could have thought that Elizabeth was too old. I mean, Mary was young, and she could have thought that. And, and actually, Elizabeth could have thought this nothing but a young whippersnapper. And she could have been like, mm, you know, no. So it, they could have resisted that, but they didn't. And Mary started with a question, right? How can this be, in verse 34, and ended with a statement, may it be done. Now, if that's not the Holy Spirit, nothing is. Like, that is really powerful. So, are you active in seeking out spirit-filled influences that encourage you, you're all leaders, that talk to you, that challenge you to be spirit-filled? See, we cannot settle for less. On a regular basis, I make it a priority to talk to my discipler, Mary. And I also love to be discipled by Elizabeth Elliot. Do you read her books? Oh, my word. So good. All of Elizabeth Elliot's books. So my discipler speaks into me and my tendencies as a leader, both those tendencies that I see that are positive and those that are not. I also have other deeply passionate women around me, some of whom are younger, such as Dawn, who purposely and carefully speak into me, and I welcome them to do that, okay? A key to that has recently hit me that, yes, they have knowledge, yes, they have wisdom, but what they almost always have is joy, and I want it just a ripple into me and ripple through me then. So what did Mary receive at that moment as the Holy Spirit filled Elizabeth and she spoke over this young thing? Mary received support. She received encouragement and belief. And it was the work of the Spirit and Mary received, us, received it, which leads us to this. Your faith is strengthened and expanded by reception. Elizabeth uttered one sentence, blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill what he spoke to her. And that sentence set Mary's heart in motion. And you can read this at another time. Those verses from 46 to 55, I mean, Mary's heart is just like exploding in her faith and her expansion of her concept of what God is doing in her life. One sentence from Gabriel, consider your cousin, and Mary moved. One sentence from Elizabeth, blessed is she who believes, and it moves Mary into action. Propelled, why? Because of receptivity. The proof of the reception came with motion. Motions are spiritual promptings to apply a specific part of scripture, whether you've read it, heard it, or remembered it, to a specific part of your life, okay? It means we're receiving and we are teachable. An article in Desiring, Desiring God said this, how many holy motions are, kindled, are kindled in hearing the word which die as soon as they are kindled for want of resolution, how many times do you hear a good message and then you don't put it in motion? Okay, I'm going to stop there for a second. How many of you are pastor's wives? Okay, quite a few of you are pastor's wives. So I take lots of notes when Rick is speaking. In fact, one of the discipleship tools I use whenever I'm meeting with a, a young woman that I'm discipling is the sermon notes from Sunday. We sit down. She knows we're going to sit down, so she's listening better on Sunday. <laughs> Who else is listening better on Sunday? Whose mind is staying focused in, right? But I'll tell you, one of my favorite days is Monday. Because Monday, if you follow me on Facebook, almost every Monday, I type, I, I post, that's the word. I, I'm 60. <laughs> I post, <laughs> I post the nuggets I got from Rick's message. Because by posting those, again, it's into my head more, right? I'm praying that it might bless somebody else. But it's for me. I'm, I'm like, so, and then I sit there and go, 
how am I going to live this? Because also in discipleship, we talk about now how are we going to live this? Okay, so vitally important for us to be listeners and to be receivers and then to put it into motion. So are you in a spot where you can receive? Truth is people are more open to run to others and hear truth at certain uh, times in their life. For example, like in transitions. And many of us go through lots of transitions in our lives. Um, Also, when we're under tension, a lot of times, um, we'll be more willing to receive at that point. But I think the thing about it is, we can't be willing to receive here and there. We have to be willing to receive now and again. Now and again. Will you delight in reception? My heart is simply to remind you that we're going to leave here and there will be moments in our lives disrupted by agitations and the threat of self-deception. Times we will be overwhelmed as we serve. But hope travels with us. And by inviting another person into your life at different moments, not necessarily only your discipler, but may, you know, the person who's over child, kids ministry, the person that's over teen ministry, well, like when people are talking and speaking to you, be a receiver. Receptivity is born out of your attitude and it's validated by your actions. Here's the consequence. If we in this group right here are not receivers, we can hear but choose not to respond. We can hear and make it a temporary fix. Okay, I'll fix this just for about 30 seconds. Thanks so much. And we can give impression of receptivity, but hide it behind our own sinful pleasures. So my question this morning to you, will you, will I be a lifelong learner and receiver? Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we would ask for hearts willing to receive. Sometimes, Lord, our heart is so overwhelmed by ministry and people's difficulties and the darkness. And Lord, sometimes the the conflict that happens and when people are not really happy. And Lord, there's so many things that can distract us from having a receptive heart, a lifelong learner, that kind of we just forget it because we're in this dark space. So, Father, I pray you'll shine your light down. And I pray that we will be women who can just radiate your radiant joy. Lord, give us a freshness as we walk out of here to say, I'm going to live this because the example is from scripture. And Lord, help us to be willing to have somebody speak into us, to keep us fresh, to keep us energized, to keep us, Lord, focused on you. May Holy Spirit influences come into our lives. But Lord, um, help us just just to be willing to, to hear what people are saying. And Lord, we'll give you the praise for that because that will keep us, Lord, focused on you. And so we pray this over our lives in Jesus' name. Amen.